what's going on guys? It is Brian and Jack from Simple Man's Comics. And do we have a show for you? We find out no one puts Nora in the corner. We also have a new Green Lantern this week, plus a bunch more. All that is going down right now on The Bolo Show. Before we get into that, Jack, how was new comic book day, buddy? Oh man, it was great. You know, and this has been a big week, the debut of Disney Plus. We've got a Disney Plus review video right here on the channel and that's some of the new pop culture content that we're looking to bring to you the simple Mints comics youtube family and uh yeah it's been a great week so far excited for it to continue and uh see what back issues are moving this week right real quick before we get into the bolo content we have a few announcements as always this show is brought to you from slabbedheroes.com nick groman at slabbed heroes get those modern guarantee nine eights at a great price but he also has raw comics and he's even starting to carry some exclusive store variants as well so make sure you check out nick at slabbedheroes.com we also want to talk about our own stuff here where we have patreon if you want to support the channel you can support the channel patreon.com forward slash simple man's comics but even better we have that bolo mystery box with some great bolo goodness we're putting in titles that we talk about on this show we're also putting in channel sponsor frankie's comics books as well so bolo box mystery box what we gotta say about that jack well yeah this is a, a project you and i have been working on uh for several months we've tweaked it we've kind of gotten it where we where we want it um Shout out to uh, Kevin Fields at Frankie's Comics for hooking us up with some incredible variants. Every Bolo box comes with one Frankie's Comics exclusive variant. Um, we've got virgin covers. We've got trade dress covers. We've got super limited stuff. We've got indies. We've got big two. We've got everything. And uh, that's a real solid anchor for these boxes. We also got some great stuff coming up, Brian. We've got some slabbed heroes action coming. Uh, we've got some comicbookinvest.com uh, variants coming, and you mentioned we've got an exclusive t-shirt on the way, uh, an excellent, excellent new Simpleman's Comics swag t-shirt uh, featuring Carnage, kind of a, an homage to this whole absolute Carnage craziness that we've been talking about on the channel for the last several months. Right, and it's important to know this shirt will only be printed once for December's Bolo Box. After that, it won't be printed again. So if you want that t-shirt, want to support the channel, sign up at patreon.com forward slash Simple Man's Comics. Do it by November 29th and make sure you message me on Patreon your shirt size so we can get that turned in because these will be going out in December's Premium Bolo Boxes. That's right, and you will still be getting one of those exclusive variants that we just spoke of as well in your box. So excellent value going out in December. And with that being said, up on the screen right now, we have this week's Bolo List. What this show is all about is the Bolo List that comes from Jack. He creates the list, but the list actually comes from the comic book community. And for those that aren't aware, Bolo stands for Be On The Lookout. And this list covers first appearances, reader buzz, variant buzz, and then Jack offers a long-term play at the end. Right, Jack? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head. The list comes from all of you on social media talking about books, posting your books, posting your picks of the week. And you know what? Even those Bolo list knockoffs. Shout out to you guys, because, again, you're just contributing to the list. You're letting us know what you're looking at. So shout out to everybody who's talking about New Comic Book Day leading into every Wednesday. Right. Definitely. All those lists are great. It's all one big comic book community. But we're here talking about the original Bolo list, and we're going to get into it right now with the first appearances for this week. And kicking off those first appearances, we get X-Men number two. Right, and here we get the first appearance of the High Summoner. Um, this X-Men series it has a ton of buzz going for it. Jonathan Hickman spawning out of the House of X and Powers of Ten series. Um, a lot of people paying attention to it. Issue number one had a big shock. Issue number two now brings in a new character. There is a lot of buzz going around. I think we kind of expected Jonathan Hickman to bring in kind of some, some new flavor. And with him being in charge of this total X universe, I think we have to at the very least pay initial attention to his new characters. Um, and, as well as the first appearance, we have kind of a variant catching heat, that Wolverine variant on the far right, um, kind of continuing that flower-themed variant that we saw 
throughout uh, House of Powers of X seems to uh, have the attention of the market. Not necessarily burning it up uh, over ratio type deal, but um, definitely shared a lot on social media. I see a lot of people picking it up. It seems to have a lot of people's attention. Could be one to keep an eye on. Right, so I did read House of X, Power of X. Like I said, I wasn't a huge X-Men fan, but I was enjoying those titles. But I'm going to tell you right here, it's not that this book is bad. It's just I'm out. <laughs> I'm not picking up this this title anymore. Um, too many other titles, too many other books. I, it's hard enough to read it as much as I can. I gave it the good old college try. I might try to pick it back up and trade or catch up later on. But as far as like pool list or picking these up issue after issue, I'm out. And it's interesting you say that because you have kind of publicly said that your rule is that you try to hang in there through the first arc and you're pulling out early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> pull out game is strong here <laughs> yeah uh, so many things i want to say to that but instead i'm just gonna move move along move along next book in first appearances we get fallen angels number one all right brian well you know what if the high summoner didn't get you excited. How about the daughter of Kwan? I think it's pronounced. Um, now, that may be a new character to some of you if you're not really paying attention to the X universe, but it's really not. This is uh, kind of the new name for Psylocke. Um, so we have what seems to be Psylocke's daughter. And Brian, you and I have been kind of wishy washy on these children of characters' um, appearances, you know. Um, but again, this is something we have to pay attention to. This is, uh, you know, a whole new Jonathan Hickman universe here we're building with this entire X universe. And I got to believe this was created in issue number one for a reason. I got to believe that this is going to do something and going to go somewhere. Now, as far as uh, a read goes, this was one I was kind of ignoring because I mentioned this when we originally talked about kind of uh, – these upcoming X series, there's so many of them again. How did we get – this is what bothers me about what's going on with the X-Men titles is how did we get back into a place where there's like 10 different X teams? Um, now, that's the negative. The positive is you're talking about Psylocke. You're talking about X-23. You're talking about Cable. That's a pretty cool team. Um, and what that ended up doing is we ended up getting – a number of store variants for this book, which I think is going to hurt maybe like the Del Otto one in fifth variant, which is on the bottom left of the screen. Um, because I just think there's going to be accessible copies of that book. Although I am seeing it go slightly over ratio from some retailers already. Um, which is interesting because the one in 100 Rob Liefeld variant all the way on the right is actually going a little bit below ratio. So, I think that's a lot to do with cover art and the preference in cover art, but the first appearance hasn't really garnered that major buzz, but it could be a sleeper to keep an eye out for. If you are in the market for the first appearance and you want to pick up the first appearances, Brian, I think you know what I always say in this situation. Grab that cover A. The cover A is going to be accessible. It's going to be cheap. You're going to have a lower buy-in, um, and you know there's a if that character pops later on, those will – dry up and you'll be able to kind of turn a positive ROI rather than chasing um, these high-end and expensive variants. But if you're a Delato fan or if you're a Rob Liefeld fan, these are some cool variants also to take a look at. Yep. I sat this one out as well, but if I were to pick up any of these, I actually like that Greg Land cover the best, which is like the bottom in the middle, the white. Yeah. Yeah. I like that Greg Land as well. I think this of all the books I think they did kind of uh, across the board a good job with uh, cover art. Yes, except for, I mean, I'm not too big on <laughs> whatever the MS-DOS the MS -DOS yeah. cover. <laughs> yeah, whatever those variants are that they're doing. That series. They're, um, calling, they're calling them the design variants, aren't they, I believe? or But it's not yeah, really. Yeah, I, I think it's based on the designs of the logos, Yeah, the new, the new logos that each team is getting, and we've even seen, like, an announcement um, – Shout out to Nick from Key Collector who posted it on Twitter, kind of asking and posing the question of what did everybody think about the new Wolverine logo? I'm going to weigh in right now. I hate it. I hate the new Wolverine logo with uh, the um, the kind of Jonathan Hickman font. Give me that good old school classic Wolverine trade dress. 
All right. Then the next one we're going to pick up in the first appearances is Justice League Odyssey number 15. This is what? First appearance of Gamma Knife? Yeah. Um, did not read this issue. This is a book that I pick up. Um, this is. Let me tell you something. If you're not reading Justice League Odyssey, this is a very good read. This series has been um, a lot of action in it, a lot of... Um, kind of uh some cool characters you know this has been kind of uh, a, a jessica cruz front and center series um it's you know it's it's, an, it's funny i sound hypocritical because right i'm talking about offshoot x-men books now we're talking about an offshoot justice league book but this is it this is one that uh for me has been a little bit better than the justice league and some people may feel some sort of way about that because i know scott snyder can do no wrong in most people's eyes but what I also have loved about this series, and again, you know, I, from a secondary market perspective, which honestly, Brian, I don't even care about it anymore. I don't even care about talking about these DC cover views from a secondary market perspective. They're just cool, and they're great in your collection. Um, if I'm picking up runs of books, get rid of that ugly year of the villain trade dress. Give me that awesome, you know, dark side, uh, um, Luisio Perillo variant. I'll take that all day. Uh, and these Perillo variants have been awesome throughout this run. I disagree with the Perillo. Just because I like him. He's he's in his element with the Vampirella Red Sonya. But the one thing that I don't like with some of these Justice League Odyssey covers, and we've talked about this before, is it's almost too dark. It's like like the... The white balance is off when they took the picture, and it's <laughs> it's like I feel you. Uh, the one thing I'll say is this story's been a little dark, so yeah. there's been there's there's some fit to that. Um, but I think some of the things that he's done with Jessica Cruz are incredible. Yeah, it's like I think the art is gorgeous. I just wish it wasn't as as dark. That that kind of keeps me from buying it. But at the same time. I'm not a big fan of that cover A either. Good thing. This is the one where the inside of the book is a lot better than the outside of the book for me anyway. Yeah, and you're not the only one who feels that way about Perillo. I think it's, so it's fair. Um, it's it's a split kind of community, um, and it, which is one of the beauties of this show, right, Brian? Yeah. Um, we like to coin ourselves as kind of sports talk radio for comics. Um, Brian and I are co-hosts, but we don't agree on everything. Um, and... Perio is one of those things that divides us. Maybe it's my Italian pride um, that keeps me hanging in with my guy, but um, his covers just strike me. And and I don't mind the fact that there's a lack of a background or um, they tend to have a darker tone. And those are the two things I hear. I hear quite often is some people want to see more like action in the background, and we don't often get that with him. Yeah, you get that a lot with Alex Gardner also. Yeah. But yeah, it's more of a portrait style. Yeah. But yeah, there's some Perio books I like a lot, but then there's some that I don't. Like like I said, Vampirella, Red Sonya, I usually pick those up automatically. But and That's going to wrap us up for first appearances this week. Real quick, before we move into the reader buzz, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button for us. It helps us out a lot. And also, comment down below while we're going through the show. Let us know what books you guys picked up this week. Let us know, did you like that Perio variant? We always like to get comments. We reply to as many as we possibly can. That being said, we're going to get into the Reader Buzz section for this week. And the first book on the Reader Buzz section, we're going to go with, sticking with DC, we're going to get Event Leviathan number six. Yes, now I'm going to go ahead and say, we talked about this with the, uh, the Simplements Comics family consistently, that you guys have let us know this is a talk about New Comic Book Day. This is a talk oftentimes that gets involved in the secondary market. So you want us to talk spoilers. But I also have to recognize, Brian, that we get new viewers on a regular basis. So because of that, I want to go ahead and say, spoiler alert. Because we're going to talk about the conclusion of Event Leviathan here. Um, and I don't want to sit and get into a situation where somebody's getting upset with us. But this is a, this is a series where... You and I were kind of anticipating it um, when it first got announced by Brian Michael Bendis. It kind of had a mystery whodunit story. We had a masked uh, main character who they waited till this issue, the sixth and final issue, to reveal who this character um, 
who this character was, and um, there was a lot of intrigue surrounding it. And I don't know about you, Brian, but it didn't necessarily live up the ending to me that as what I would have hoped for. How did you feel about it? I was the same way, but if I'm being realistic, it doesn't live up to the hype, but it has lived up to the trend of Brian Michael Bendis as of late. <laughs> when you're expecting yeah. some a payoff that doesn't pay off like you, you hoped. Yeah, and we may have maybe we built it up in our mind, right? I these first off these covers, especially these Alex Maleev covers for the cover B's have been um absolutely uh absolutely amazing um but we kind of got to a point with uh with this series where th- first off the reading of this series has been great from issue to issue i've enjoyed this series if you haven't read it i think this is a good pick up and trade one i think that's really the best way to put it um i think if i would have picked this one up from the get-go and trade or I'd wait probably- for the animated movie yeah, well, this will be a very good. Yeah, it's a good. That's a good point, Brian, because this will be a very good animated movie. But if I would have waited um, to pick this one up and trade, I probably would have loved it. But going month to month, it got to a point where like I was really anticipating man, who could Leviathan be, and I had all of these big names. Now, I'm starting to get DC's mo when they reveal these characters, and we're gonna say who the who the character is, um, but. It seems that they're using underutilized characters when they do these big splashy reveals. Um, and it's smart, right? Because you take a character you're not really doing anything with and you elevate them. You make them more important. Yeah, you kind of put them over. Yeah, yeah. It, if that's what it feels like in a wrestling sense. Um, so I get it. But I was hoping this was going to be um, maybe a heel turn for a – use another wrestling term, term um, for a major hero or something. But – it's funny because Leviathan's a Manhunter, and maybe one of the characters who never came to mind was Manhunter himself. So this is the second Manhunter, Mark Shaw, is revealed as um, as Leviathan. Now, if you're not familiar with Manhunter, you've probably, if you're a comic collector, you've probably seen his first appearance. You've probably seen it at some point. It is one of those DC first issue specials where DC was kind of throwing out first issues to see like what would sell, if any of them would sell. They would move on with a series, and it was actually done by Jack Kirby. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of got some history. It is a findable issue. These back issues have taken off on the secondary market. But I can't tell you over the years how many of these I've picked up. Um, and and I, I would pick them up just for the Jack Kirby-ness of it. The big question is, what's going to be Leviathan's role in the DC Universe after this? We don't really know. Um, it was a fun series. It maybe just – it didn't – knock you out with that issue six it kind of just jabbed at you so it's all gonna be about where we go from here so i agree was it was a decent read but it didn't pay off like it i wanted it to but this next book we're gonna talk about this week i enjoyed the heck out of this book and this is detective comics 1015 um here we get where nora she's like no longer playing second fiddle she's like screw you why are you trying to always make me do what you want to do I'm going to go do my own thing and embrace all this power that I have now. Yeah, and it's funny, Brian, when I did the long-term pick of the week with Detective Comics 1014, which, by the way, I feel very good about that pick as we sit here today talking about Detective Comics 1015. Um, we heard some, some, you know, again, you're always, you put yourself out there like this, you're going to hear negativity. That, that We don't even stress about that. I don't even worry about that. But there were some people who didn't like the pick, and they kept saying, well, it's not Nora Freeze's first appearance. And I've pointed out on the channel before, you got to distinguish between, when you look at the, the cover of cover A, you see F-R-E-E-Z-E. That is the villain name of this character. This is essentially, that's their moniker. Um, we're not talking about Nora Freeze, F-R-I-E-S. Um, Mrs. Freeze is a badass. Um, and you're right. She's really embracing the power. She's, you know, she's been on ice for how many years? Yeah. Um, she goes full on Elsa at the end of this story. Yeah. Um, <laughs> she look. let me tell you something. She looks cool. She is as cold hearted as the character would suggest. Um, it things are not going the way Dr. Freeze kind of imagined. Um, and 
she's been put in place to be a formidable villain. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I was like, I got more excited about the potential that she has coming out of this book and how I could totally, depending on what they do with her, you could see, you know, it it won't ever happen because the popularity is there, but slide over Harley Quinn because this bitch is badass. Yeah, and I sit there and I go, for certain, slide over Dr. Freeze. (laughs) Because I feel like we've told his entire story. His entire motive, that was another negative thing I heard was, well, his entire motivation was saving her. Now, once he's done it, there's nothing for him. All right, there's nothing for him. But now she's got a world of motivation, man. She's been on ice for how many years? Um, Imagine if you came out into the world and realized that you had just lost so many years of your life. Um, but she hasn't aged and, um, you know, she's got this angst and, um, she's got this person who was basically trying to stop her from making her way back to the world. Yeah. Um, but he trained her up at least. <laughs> yes. So, you know, um, uh, like I said, and here's the, you know, the big thing is Brian, the optics, she looks cool. Yeah. So I, I tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and to quote my man, Arun Singh. I'm going to go ahead and throw a bolo audible on this. I'm telling you, Detective Comics 1014 is a if, – if it's still sitting on your LCS shelf, you're going to want that one, I think. But either way, I think this is going to be a good reader run. We also talk about sets, right? I think this is going to be a good set, this 1014, 1015, 1016, because we talked about it on the last call show. She's going head-to-head in the next issue with Batman one-on-one, and it looks like it's going to be a slugfest. I definitely agree, and um... – I've been enjoying Detective Comics the past few issues. Haven't wouldn't you say, Brian, that both Detective Comics and Batman have been good for the last few months? They've been fun reads. Outside of that Magnum PI Batman issue, yes. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. But I enjoyed Tomasi's run on on Superman before they pulled him off of there. But either way. Detective Comics has been great, and, and if you haven't been reading it, at least pick it up through the last arc, because this, this uh, Mr. Freeze, Mrs. Freeze arc has been great, and <laughs> full bonehead moment, I was, reading the, I was reading the book, and at one point Batman said something like, we have to go after Freeze, but <laughs> I read it, that we gotta go get fries, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, man, this guy's hungry, but uh, yeah, great issue, definitely recommend it to people. Gonna... And I think, you know, quietly, Brian, you know, I haven't heard anyone talk about it, so I think I'm going to be the first one to say it. Um, probably not the first one to say it, but we've heard a lot of talk about DC being down. I want to say that DC has been on a consistent run between the heat behind the black label, um, the reader buzz behind some of the, the Batman and Detective stuff. Um, they've, they've been making some quiet moves. All right. We'll have to see if they can keep that momentum. And this is one also I'd actually pick up cover A over cover B. I think cover B looks cooler, but I like Ms., Mrs. Freeze or, or Nora right there on the cover. Yeah, I think I think for this entire run, I want whatever covers she's on. Yep. And you mentioned DC Black Label, and that brings us to the next book, which is back to that whole Hill House with Dollhouse Family number one. Yeah, and you know, you don't know what's going to happen with these. Um I keep hearing a lot of talk um, about speculation involving HBO. I think that comes from Key Collector kind of speculating that. And, and again, you can't even get mad at him because he's just speculating. And uh, I think people forget what that word means. But uh, these books seem to ha- have not necessarily their own universe, but definitely their own feel. They're, these are straight horror books. Um, and, you know, I think cover A is cool. I think cover B is cool. I like that it's kind of got a traditional um it's it's black label right but it's not coming in like the prestige format right. so i think it's a little bit more accessible when you're trying to break a new imprint like hill house i think coming with the traditional comic book form is smart so i think dc's marketing department is doing a good job um you know this is another joe hill book but it's it's not joe hill written this is mike carey um but, you know, I, th- I, th- I have high expectations for this series. I have not got a chance to read this one. This is another one I want people to let us know. Like, if you read it, what did you think? Um, I'm not a traditional horror guy, so, you know, sometimes I miss the boat on this stuff. So let me know. Uh, I can't tell you how many books I've picked up because viewers have let us know you need to read this. Yeah, one thing I noticed is, well, at least for me, in my opinion, whenever I'm reading horror comics, uh, 
The story can be great, but if a horror comic has like crappy art, it, it kind of <laughs> lowers the whole experience. Like when you get a yeah. horror comic, the, the art's got to help. The art and the story, I mean, you can say that for any comic, but specifically for me for horror, if the art's fantastic, sometimes the writing will be subpar and, and the, horror, the horror comic and the art and it just kind of raises the bar for me. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things. Uh, even looking at like a horror movie, um, you can have a good story, but if things look out of place or look kind of um, cheap, it doesn't quite pan out well. That's part of the suspense and scare yeah. is the visuals. Which, funny you say that. I will say, loved uh, House of Thousand Corpses, loved Devil's Rejects, Three from Hell. It's still a good movie, but the cinematography definitely carried that movie over more than the story but and then moving right on we're going to family tree from image this one um yeah it has a lot of people buzzing about it um we may see uh quite often larry doherty from larry's comics in the chat um he was really talking this one up uh um and i don't want to make it seem like he was super putting it over but he said that he made a comment that jeff lemire is his favorite writer and he gets worried that when a writer like Jeff Lemire, man, this guy, he he and Cullen Bunn, um, as far as like independent comics, busiest guys in the game. I'd also throw Donny Cates just in general in that. Yeah, I mean, you almost amazing. feel like they have bodies in their freezers the way they write such great horror books all the time. <laughs> right, right, yeah. It's got to be a scary dude. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he delivered with another one. This one's getting some solid reader buzz. Um, good reviews. People are excited for it, so it'll be interesting. I haven't read this one yet either, but I'm interested too. Um, it's definitely one I've grabbed, and um, you know, it's interesting that Lemire just never disappoints for me. Um, I always seem to really – he's a writer who tonally I tend to really like his stuff. Yeah, he's another one that I like his writing more than I like his art. Yeah, I, I mean, and that's not to down his art, yeah. but yeah, he's at his best for me when he's writing the story. That's where I like. That's why I like him. He does great art. I mean, a lot of people like it. It's just the. It's a specific style, right. though. It's kind of like Ben Temple Smith, or you know, people tend to like it. But either way, moving on. This next book, I know Patreon member and fellow YouTuber, comic man Andy, definitely picked this up. I have it. haven't had a chance to read it yet, but we did talk about this on the last call show, right? Right. Punisher Soviet. We're getting kind of a, um, a out of the country, um, old school Punisher story from Garth Ennis. Um, and this one, I would never expect to have major secondary market success. You're not going to see an MCU movie based on this storyline more than likely, but hell you never know. Right. But, um, this I would just expect. This is like a love letter to me to Punisher fans. This is the Punisher series a Punisher fan wants to read. This reminds me of Punisher Max. Um, this is some real badass Punisher action, um, and I think that there's few people who can tell a story with the Punisher out right now, like Garth Ennis. So I think it's the perfect placement, perfect writer. Um, I think this is going to be a fun one. This whole miniseries. Yeah, it's funny because right after we talked about this on the last call, we mentioned similar points with Garth Ennis. Like right after that, within the past few weeks, I've reread Volume 1 and Volume 2 of that Punisher Max omnibus. And uh, Jeff John's Green Lantern run is still probably one of my favorite in comics, but man, that Punisher Max run is so good. Yeah, yeah, the Punisher Max run is absolutely incredible. Um, and I even like... Uh, I like everything that he appeared in during the Max series. I liked when he even crossed over into like the Fool Killer Max series, um, which was like a real different take on Fool Killer, their kind of relationship. Uh, that's the kind of Punisher I like. Then the next book we're going to talk about is from an indie publisher, and this is from Mad Cave Studios. We're talking about RV9. This is written by Ben Goldsmith. We had the privilege of talking to Ben at Baltimore Comic Con for his Source Point Press book at the time. But RV9, this is something he's been working on. Really glad it came out today. Definitely happy to support him by picking this book up and support Mad Cave because a lot of great people at Mad Cave. But RV9, it's gotten some good buzz. Yeah, and you know what, though? They're, first off, we're going to talk about a couple different angles. Number one, it had 
good secondary market sales leading up into the release of this book. There were some $20 pre-orders. You will see that from time to time, though, with Mad Cave because so few um, books kind of get ordered. It's still a small publisher. Um, another thing about this book that it had kind of almost working against it but will long-term be working for it is releasing So Close to Wolvenheart, which had a much larger um, buzz going for it and reception within the market. Uh, as far as like retail orders, uh, I think that that allowed RV9 to be slept on a bit. The art in RV9 is incredible. Also getting to talk to Ben Goldsmith, it's kind of like what, what you mentioned. We got kind of an inside take. I was not aware kind of the way the writing scheme is with this book. The way that every time the, the main character is an assassin. And every time she kind of goes into a situation... It perspectively changes, and you're like looking at it through kind of her perspective. It really gives you almost a video game like feel um, with the writing. I appreciate creativity in that aspect, and you should not be surprised that this is coming from Ben Goldsmith. You may not be familiar with that name, but I think in comics we're going to need to get familiar with that name. He is the guy who wrote that Source Point Press book. Um, Beyond the Demon Sea, I believe it's called. It's like Beyond uh, the Sea of the Demon. Yeah, Sea of the Demon, um, which is notoriously done with like tattoo art, and it's a one shot. There's going to be two other version, two other one shots with different styles of tattoo art. You're going to see kind of like an American classic, and you're going to see um, a pinup girl style. The, these two books are so very different. These two books, though, are very like high bar. And what I mean by that is he didn't just write a traditional comic like everybody else does. He really went out there and tried to do something a little different. This he went, out, he went Method writing, he went out there and killed some people or something. Well, I just think the, <laughs> the whole perspective change thing. Um, I've got a couple of the sneak previews yeah. um, that I picked up at Baltimore Comic Con. So I'm going to go ahead and say, like, be on the lookout for that. I, I think this is a series that could easily be um, adapted. Uh, we've mentioned that with several of Mad Cave series. They have yet to have that hit. It's only a matter of time. Only a matter of time before um, Hollywood starts paying attention to their portfolio. And, and when you're a new publisher, you have to kind of build up that portfolio. But RV9, Wolvenheart, these are easier stories to get adapted. Then certainly it would be for them to do like Knights of the Golden Sun or Honor and Curse, which would be much more expensive films to produce. Um, so RV9 has a lot going for it. I would, I would... Like I said, look for that uh, sneak preview that they were giving out at conventions. I'll tell you firsthand, those are hard to get in good shape. A lot of people handling those, um, that those are tough to find in mint condition. Find your favorite presser for that. And I also want to send a shout out to our channel buddy, uh, Andy Timberland of the Indie Spotlight series and Bat Comic Shop. He has an LB Cole uh, homage that went on sale today, which is Wednesday. Yeah, um, it, it'll be have been available for 24 hours if it's still available um, at Bat Comics, BatComicShop.com. It's an LB Cole homage. If you're not familiar with LB Cole, Golden Age artist, um, has done a lot of uh, iconic covers. Um, it's kind of cool that uh, Andy took it to there. His love for the Golden Age seems to have become infected within him. So uh, the 200 print run, twenty dollar buy in. Yeah, he's definitely a little Tyrone Biggums with that Golden Age stuff right now. Yeah, I saw it happen to him, right? He was Mr. <laughs> Indie Spotlight Series. He came to Heroes Con this year, and it's like it got infected in his blood, and uh, it took him over symbiote style, and now he's Mr. Golden Age as well. So the last book we're going to talk about in the Reader Buzz section is one that we've talked about a lot on this channel, and this is that boom book, and we're talking about Folklords number one. This had... Originally, it had, what, the three covers for it? Well, it had the four, because it had the regular cover, the cover B... Then they announced the FOC variant, and then was it the one in fifty variant? One in twenty-five, and at, yeah, you could really say originally it had two covers. You had the cover A and the cover B. I love the cover B. I love the colors on it. Um, great cover. And then we got the FOC variant from Dan Mora. Dan Mora, if you're not familiar, he did a lot of the covers for Once and Future. He does a lot of the stuff for Power Rangers. Um, he came with a killer cover, and then they kind of flipped that cover. You see the one in twenty-five variant where you kind of get the sketch version with like those dark inks. And then you get the late breaking, like I'm talking about like new comic book day announced um, one per store. I think it was like the eve of new comic book day. We heard about it as books started shipping in. Um, 
one per store variant kind of the full sketch treatment for this book. I got to say, Ryan, these books are moving. But under undervalued, we're seeing the one in twenty five go for about twenty dollars. We're seeing the one per store go for about twenty five. I think people, um, we've talked about this before that the, sometimes the one per stores go, can go for less than the one in twenty five because the thought is that there's more of the one per stores than there are the one in twenty fives. I don't think so in this case, Brian. I think there's probably far more one in twenty fives because people knew about this. We were screaming folklords, folklords, folklords months ago. Um, this has some serious reader buzz. Matt Kin uh, really killed that first issue. Um, if anyone's going to complain about the first issue, they're going to say maybe like they don't get enough of the story. But man, that's that storytelling at its finest because when you hit that last panel, you are ready to go into issue number two. This is going to be one that I think people are going to be highly anticipating the next issue. And it went to a second print early. And it looked like Boom got themselves into the same situation as Once in Future where went to a second print. Um, again, they did the predetermined print run. It's not Boom playing games with speculators or anything. I mean, these companies, they're bigger than that. Um, and the second print sold out. They had to go to a third print. I would for sure be on the lookout for that second print. Um, we're hearing that that's going to have a low print number. Um, so that's something that I would pay attention to. I would expect it to go similarly to what we saw with Once in Future. Yeah. And I will say, if you haven't read this, minus everything aside from it, give it a read. This is one fantastic story. I always equate it to Dungeons and Dragons meet M. Night Shyamalan's The Village. And I'll tell you what now, this is going to have, for me... <laughs> Every time I put a suit on and someone asks why I'm wearing a suit, I'm definitely telling them I'm going to go because I'm going to pick my quest. <laughs> People are not going to know what I'm talking about unless they read Folklords. But also, there was a couple exclusives of, um, available for this. I know Black Capes, they had that Drew Zucker. We were big fans of Drew Zucker from Tanto. Yeah, yes. Shout out to Drew Zucker, friend of the channel. Right. Um, love seeing him do some work outside of, of Canto. So this is available on um, blackcapecomics.com. Drew Zucker uh, is a limited print run. I forget what it was. I want to say, what, like 300? Yeah, 300 print run. Um, I want to say it is 19.99 on the website. Right. And then also our friends over at comicbookinvest.com, they have one that's kind of a mashup between the FOC and the 1 in 25 variant, correct? Yeah, this was the last project I worked on before um, you and I made our exit from comicbookinvest.com, CBSI. We are now, if you haven't paid attention um, to the article that was posted online, we are now completely independent, uh, simplemanscomics.com, uh, to the Simplemans Comics YouTube channel. Um, but this was the last thing I was kind of working on with the CBSI owner, Ben C. We got in there under the gun at the last second for a uh, Folklords variant, and we couldn't get new art, so we took that... Dan Mora, um, FOC variant. Uh, we took that 125, we kind of mashed them up together. Talk about a cool rainbow collection to put together. If you get that FOC, you get that one in 25, you get that one per store, and you get that uh, comicbookinvest.com variant. I think that's a cool set to put together, one to be on the lookout for. 500 print run, $16 from comicbookinvest.com. Um, definitely a low buy-in for this one and they've also got uh bundles with the 125 and the foc variant right and then pro portion of the any of the proceeds going to charity like they normally do or absolutely same process they always do a uh, portion of the uh profits going to charity um i believe they're working with um might be american cancer society i don't, wanna, don't quote me wrong now but they, they they're definitely doing something with cancer now um same deal with my light bag, um, half back board, individually numbered sticker of authenticity. So the good folks, comicbookinvest.com, always putting in that high quality. So definitely check that out. Those are still available on the site. That's going to wrap up the reader buzz section. We're going to roll now right into the good old variant buzz section of the Bolo list. Starting with Marvel Action Spider Man number 11. This is that John Boy Myers incentive variant, right? Right, that one in ten incentive. And now you may remember we talked about that uh, number ten. We talked about that a couple times on the channel. We talked about it um, the pre FOC show, and I had told everybody that that was my pick. 
Um, we talked about it again on the Bolo show when that book was skyrocketing. That thing went up to, God, what, Brian? Like 120, 140 bucks, maybe 160 bucks at its high. Um, and, you know, we saw that coming. Now it's dropped down now to about 75. And it's funny how people negatively talk. That book going for 75, it's talking about a 1 in 10 IDW incentive. Um, and this one, I knew this was going to happen again, Brian. I knew it was going to happen again because, again, this is why you guys need to watch the last call show. You need to understand FOC and how FOC works. If you're going to make educated speculation plays, if you're just trying to be a collector, it's not even about speculation. If you're just a collector and you – the reason why we wanted to cover this book on, on the pre-FOC show – um, in specific was we wanted to make sure Venom collectors, we know how rabid you guys are. We know how completionist you guys are. We want to make sure you guys were aware that this was even happening um, because we knew what would happen in the secondary market because Brian and I have nine years of secondary market experience. And sure enough, because of when the FOC window was for this, FOC had passed by the time the craze of issue 10 went on and you could not go back and up your orders for this. This book is trading today for about $50. Um, again, five times ratio, guys. That's incredible. That's the same thing um, on a ratio to ratio basis of a 1 in 25 Marvel variant going for a buck and a quarter. That's the same thing as a 1 in 100 going for $500. So that's incredible. That is a big hit. On a book that a lot of people were able to pre order for cover price or pre order for eight to 10 bucks. I got number 10. I didn't pick up number 11. I picked up cover A again. Because mm -hmm. I've been liking the cover for this, and I've been liking the story, so definitely got that. And um, yeah, this one—I think it followed that trend when people saw ten go like that. They're automatically jumping on number eleven. And be on the lookout. Twelve is the—I think—is the final part of this storyline yeah. with Venom. So um, I would expect it maybe to drop a little bit more. We saw, like I said, we saw a hundred and something for the, for ten. We saw fifty. Um, it may drop down to 30 or so for 12, but you know what? Honestly, who cares? Um, great cover art and, again, m multiple times over ratio. Then the next one on the variant buzz is that Usagi Yo Yohembo. This is, what, the 35th anniversary, issue number six? Yes, issue number six of Usagi Yohembo. What's interesting about this one is we're talking about a 1 in 25 IDW variant. You do not see that too often at all. You and I have talked about this multiple times on the channel, right, Brian, that when you get those 1 in 25s, quite often um, they they are low printed. Now, this is almost seemingly out of nowhere, um, being that there's no 1 in 10 for this book. This is issue 6, but it's the 35th anniversary of the character. This is a Jeff Darrow cover. Um, he has a kind of popular cult following. Uh, it's a cool wraparound, which is why you see kind of like the style that Brian's got displayed with the image. Um, I, I don't, did not see a lot of these available. These are going right now for just over ratio, but the ratio covers are drying up. Now, remember, guys, we filmed this show on Wednesday, so everything is kind of still very, very, very fluid. We saw the Marvel Action Spider-Man triple in price from the time that we were talking about it on our show, talking about issue number 10. I'm not saying this is going to triple, but I'm just saying there's a lot of room for action. Those cheap copies are drying up, and we are starting to see the copies that are left listed go for – they're listed for like 40 bucks. I would expect to see this one be a 40 or $50 book easily. Right, and then the next book we're going to talk about on the Variant Buzz is that New Mutants War Children number one. This is the second print for that. Yeah, and this isn't one that I expect to see like a huge secondary market movement. This is for my Bill Sienkiewicz diehards. Um, this series, this this issue in and of itself, was actually kind of panned, Brian. Uh, people didn't like it. People didn't like it from a reader buzz perspective. But it sold. It sold because classic New Mutants fans, classic X fans, classic Bill Sienkiewicz fans, they wanted an opportunity to kind of get the original creators um, give this book a shot. I like how it has that old school corner box art up at the top. Absolutely. And it did so well. Sales wise, Marvel was like, oh, we'll throw a second print out. I don't think this book was printed very heavily. Um, I don't think a lot of stores probably felt the need to grab this. But, I mean, you look at that cover art. Is that not classics and Kevich? I agree. We always talk about those artists that got that style. Like, as soon as you see the cover, you know who, uh -huh. who the artist is. And this is definitely fits that mold. 
So, yeah, I can see how it appeals to Sienkiewicz fans. I can see how it appeals to this uh, nostalgic New Mutants fan because it even has that the old school New Mutants trade dress. Trade dress. Um, and it's like a print, like you said, it's probably not heavily printed. So I think it's going to be a hardcore fan, especially at first, but you never know down the road. This could be one of those cult books that all of a sudden just pops off. <laughs> I could totally see this being a sleeper book years down the road where you're like, how, why does this sell for twenty five dollars? Um, it could be one of those types. Then the next one in variant buzz is Morbius number one. This is that incentive in Hyak Lee variant, right? Yeah, this is funny. This is a, a Marvel number one of a book of a character, excuse me, where we know a movie's coming and a movie's coming with a major actor, right? And there is really not um, not a lot of buzz for this series. Would you say? I pretty much said that I felt that way when we talked about this at the last call. Right, right. You were not amped for this one. Well, I felt it's like just one. That, sorry, but it's one of those Go ones ahead. that I don't ever see it holding its own title. I think it's one of those things where it's a great character within the the Spider Verse or the the Spider Universe, Spider Man story. But every time it has its own title, it doesn't seem to last very long, or they reboot it, or and I just. It's just the trend it's been having. Well, I don't disagree with you on history. I was hopeful with this one because if they want it to be a standalone movie franchise, Brian, they got to be able to, how do you do a standalone movie franchise? You can't write the comic book standalone. Um, but I agree with you. I think Morbius works best when he's, say, like a part of a Spider-Man story or something. But um, Or yeah. Sinister Six type stuff. or yes. But you know what? Here's what's great about this book that we're talking about right here. We're talking about Inhyukli. Um Three Up, Three Down debuted on the channel yesterday. Um, you and I, when we were recording it, I said the one thing that I almost put in the up section was Inhyukli. Inhyukli is on fire. Um, all of his covers seem to do very well. He's got that consistent style, similar to reminds me of Gabriel Delato, where it's like it's getting to a point where he's starting to build completionist fans. Um, this one is selling for ratio to 60 bucks, so it's going for 50 to 60. It's going for ratio or a little over, which is very solid um, on the first day of release. And it's even more solid on, again, a series with very little buzz. I think this book has more buzz than the series itself. Now, I didn't look, but did this have like a 1 in 200 version of this cover? It didn't, right? I, it did not. Yeah, and I think that's kind of why you're at least seeing this at or above ratio right now because if they would have had that virgin i think it would have killed both of them and you well, would i think they always do right we've talked about that before i hate i hate do one or the other yeah i have no problem with a one in 200 virgin cover but don't don't do it and have a one in 50 right i didn't pick this book up i didn't pick this variant up but if you guys did if you're watching this and you picked it up and read the story let us know how it is because i didn't i didn't put it in my pull list Yep. But the next one we're going to talk about on the variant buzz is that Go Go Power Rangers number 25. It's that incentive homage cover. I think anyone around in the 90s kind of know what this is a cover for. It's that classic Nirvana album. Or you could say Weird right. Al. Weird Al. I think it's a Weird Al homage. There you go. <laughs> also, of course, you know, um, I know that uh, the Ninja Turtles did this one very successfully, did this cover with an homage very successfully. But, yeah, uh, you got that classic Nirvana, uh, was it Nevermind uh, album? Um, you know, they've got that homage. Here's the thing. You're not seeing a lot of these listed. Um, they seem to be listed for about 30 to 35. That's These Go-Go Power Ranger variants are something to keep an eye on. Um, the Every ratio one, on these, sorry, the ratio on these is what, 1 in 20? 1 in 20. Yep. And the thing about them is not a lot of stores are ordering Go-Go Power Rangers that heavy. It's always been looked at as kind of like the cartoony offshoot to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. But you and I talked about this when Necessary Evil began. We told people, like, don't sleep on the Go-Go series because this series is going back and forth with Mighty Morphin Power Rangers in this Necessary Evil story. So if you're only reading Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, you're missing out on a lot of context. Um, and they do these great 90s homage variants that I think are being overlooked and are doing solidly well in the secondary market. Yeah, because what have they, they done? Smashing Pumpkins, NSYNC, No Doubt, right? 
Yep. yep. Are the ones I yeah, think they of- were they were doing eighties movies early in the series. When they moved into the nineties, they started doing nineties album covers. So if you're somebody like our age, Brian, it's got everything that we find nostalgic. Um, it's got the movies of our childhood. It's got the music of our teenhood. Um, now nah, I mean, you can leave and sink, but I know it's going to resonate with somebody. But um, you know, it's one of those things where it's like uh, they're they're a Wu Tang album away, Brian, from having me like beyond pumped. But uh, you know that that I I like these. I think long term these are going to be solid because these will dry up and. People in Bolo Nation know. I've often talked about I love being big fish in a small pond. I love listing a variant on eBay when I'm the only one listing it, where there's no other copies. This is going to be one of those books. This is going to get bought up by Power Ranger fans. It's going to be bought up by Nirvana fans, and it's going to dry up. I promise you. Wait a year. You will not see this book available. So that wraps up the variant buzz section real quick. Before we get into the long-term plague, Again, do us a favor, click that thumbs up button, and also comment what books have you guys been reading, what books have you picked up, what is your long-term play, or what is your pick of the week even, let us know in the comments. And with that being said, we're going to get into Jack's long-term play of the week. This is the one on the bolo list you might notice we haven't talked about yet, but we're going to talk about right now, and that is Far Sector number one. This comes from that DC Young Animal imprint. We did talk about this on the last call, but this is your long-term play, Jack. Yeah, we talked about this on the last call, Brian, and we sort of predicted what was going to happen with this today. What did we talk about? We talked about first appearance of a new Green Lantern, right? An interesting perspective and take on a, on a Green Lantern. We talked about the fact that it was coming from a young animal imprint, right? And the fact that their books don't get printed heavily. I think a lot of people ran into that today when they were trying to hunt this book. Um, we talked about the fact that It wasn't called Green Lantern, right? The title wasn't Green Lantern. And I think that helped this book slip by people's radar. And then it's the perfect timing with the HBO announcement. I think people are kind of off when they're saying that they think this is the story that uh, the HBO series is going to be. They're they're not going to put that much money into something that that doesn't have much awareness yet. I wouldn't see it. I can see it being an appearance or a character on the show at some point. but Right. And I could be totally wrong. I've been wrong before, but I, I can't. Just based on experience, right, Brian? I can't see it either. Um, I would. Why would you do that when you could do? Especially when you're going up against the last Green Lantern production that you had. Right. You need the next thing you do, Green Lantern, to be solid. Um, and it's not like if you want to go minority characters. I mean, they have Jessica Cruz, they have Baz, they have John Stewart. Um, so they have options. But this is a great book. Um, you and I were. We mentioned that we're Green Lantern fans, right? We mentioned when we talked about this on Last Call that we were excited for this one. We tried, again, to let you guys know. That's why we do the Last Call show. We try to let you guys know in Simple Men's Comics family um, what we're seeing when we look at these previews lists. Brian, have you seen the secondary market sales on this book today? I haven't looked. 15 to $16 a book. Sets of the three going for about $40 on Wednesday. <laughs> um, this is being... I, this is being grabbed by the flippers. This is what happens, guys. Guys, this is, And this is why we try to talk to you guys about FOC. Maybe you couldn't make it out to the comic shop today. Um, maybe you were on the fence about this. Um, those flippers are out there now, right? Because it's going for good money. Uh, I had a feeling this was going to happen when I started to see the buzz build yesterday. Um, Brian, you'll attest, and my Simple Men's Comics family uh, Patreon members know. Um, and I'm going to put a little Patreon plug in here. Uh, We had a rough draft of the list posted to Patreon on Monday. We had the final list posted to Patreon on Tuesday before it was released to the public on Wednesday. Um, That is a new weekly thing that we're going to do now that we are independent. Um, So expect to see that. That is another reason to sign up for that Simpleman's Comics Patreon. I let you guys know that I believe Far Sector was the long-term play of the week. Um, I still believe in the long-term, but it turned out to be also a short-term play, and I'm not surprised by that. At all. And again, that brings in the flippers. And flippers are different than speculators. A speculator is somebody who looks at a book book and says, I think this is going to be good long term, right? A flipper is somebody who goes, I don't care what this book is. I can buy it right now for $4 and sell it for $16. And I'll take my 
you know, $8 after shipping and whatever profit and be happy with that. And we're seeing a lot of that with this book. So that is going to make these copies dry up even more. Um, this is going to be tough. I hope you guys put this one on your pull list. But great read, a book that got solid buzz, um, a new voice in the writer. Um, I think his name's N.K. Jemison or Jem Jemison. Um, sorry for mispronouncing the name. Um, but a new kind of a newer writer uh, I wasn't familiar with. Uh, I like the cover art. I think the cover art isn't crazy, right? It's not like you're not seeing like some huge name artists, but they all do what they need to do. They put the character of uh, Sojourner Mullen kind of like front and center. Um, I used the cover B as the background for the bowl list. So if you notice the bowl list graphic, you'll see that background. I really like that cover. I like the way the bright green props, but really I like all these covers. I think cover A long term is probably the cover to get. I like but, cover A is my favorite. I mean, I'm a I'm a fan of some McKelvey art, which is that cover C, right? But yeah. to me, I just like the cover A. I mean, you can kind of say this for the cover B too, but for cover A, to me, I mean, that is like a Green Lantern cover. Well, and then I I, I kind of um, nothing to do with say like racial or gender comparison to compare it to Naomi. Um, this book is getting major critical acclaim. And when that happens and you have kind of the IGNs and the sci-fi of the world reporting on it, they're always showing that cover A image. And I think it's going to make the moderate comic collecting crowd or kind of the following the leader of the FOMO crowd, they're going to go for that cover because that's what they see posted in those articles. We've talked about that before on the channel. So long term, that would be my bet. But I don't think it matters, man. If you can find these books at your LCS for cover price, I think you grab them. I really believe in this book long term. Cover B and C, it's interesting, were sold out at Midtown days ago. So there, there was all, a lot of indication here that this was going to happen. Um, and again, I, uh, to make one more pump for it, tune into that last call show because you know we are trying to give you guys as best we can. Again, we're doing our opinion, and it's not all speculation based. We're just giving you um, our opinion on what books interest us the most. But the thing about it is, the books that interest us tend to also interest other people in the market. So you're starting to notice a trend and uh, you know, we want to help you get the books that you want for your collection, the cheapest and easiest that we can. So you're not out there chasing these books, 15, $16. Do I think this book will drop a few dollars? I think it has the potential to drop a few dollars, right? As people get their online orders in, as these flippers keep selling it to other speculators and things like that. But at the same point, Naomi didn't really drop, right? Naomi went and became a $50, $60 book. So there's a good chance that this could happen with this because we're not looking at a huge print run for this book. But exciting story. Brian, you were really excited to read this one. You were talking to me about it before we got on the air. Um, kind of a mystery So yeah, story. Um, I also want to say, I mean, you were talking about Naomi. The similarity with that is you have the same interior artist with Jamal Campbell. Jamal Campbell, and yeah. And the art in here, it's nothing that's like super duper duper detailed but man it just fits the narrative of the story so well it's just I, I i'm not like an art critic or anything like that but for me it just fit it fit the tone it made it to where the it was nice to look at and the comic wasn't too wordy and i was telling jack this before i was like it was a great read i hate it when there's like all these little um uh, bubbles that you're trying to do that their narration to tell you the backstory and there's just so many of it that you end up skipping over half of them or at least i tend to but you didn't have that in here it was just enough and it's basically almost like i want to say murder mystery but yeah there hasn't been a murder in 500 years and there's a murder in far sector because she's in the furthest sector out for green lanterns and they don't even know if it has a number but someone gets murdered they haven't had a murder in 500 something years and that's kind of where the story picks up um, great, great read. Uh, can't say enough good things about it. as a Green Lantern fan. And then I'm happy to see a story like this on the Young Animal imprint because they've been hit or miss with some of their titles, at least in my opinion. Huge Mother Panic fan. And Far Sector is another one that one issue in, I really like. Yeah, and I can already see this one going. I'm going to make the comparison again, the Naomi route, where I think this miniseries will do well. And then I think they will eventually bring her into the DC Universe continuity somewhere and that will have to be popular so uh you know if you're not on the sojourner uh mullen kind of uh train 
now you may want to think about doing um this is a major first appearance and you know before we're done talking about this book this book was in the first appearance section it was in the reader buzz section and it was in the variant buzz section you don't see that very often and that's where you know you've really got a home run and that's why it is the long-term play of the week real quick before you mentioned you can see her popping over into dc continuity as a reader of this book i want to see the opposite first i want to see people from dc continuity show up at in this young animal imprint in this in this title series and then eventually use her in those other dc type titles because i think this that sets the tone sets this whole um i don't say universe because it exists within that green lantern universe but yeah. yeah great read and i agree it makes a great long-term play for you this week jack and that basically wraps up the bolo list for this week so we did cover those first appearances cover that reader buzz Variant buzz, and then Jack just gave his long-term play. Once again, I want to bring up that December for those Patreon Premium Bolo Box subscribers. We'll be getting that exclusive Carnage shirt plus a variant with that box as well. And if you want to sign up for that, you need to do that by November 29th. Or you can still sign up and you'll just be getting... The regular premium bolo boxes that includes that Frankie's variant as well as some other books. We got some Slab Hero books coming. We got some comicbookinvest.com variants. But what's going on tomorrow night, Jack? Well, of course, tomorrow night we've got the last call show where, again, we're going to look at some books a month out. And we're going to try to give you the leg up so that you're not sitting here chasing these hot books. You're not sitting here unaware of these indie titles. Or you're not sitting there missing a great read on a character that you truly love. Um, I think there's going to be some Green Lantern fans out there that are going to be sad that they didn't get a chance to grab this book as it becomes, you know, speculation fodder. So tune into the last call show. Um, again, we, we look to amplify your collection through integrity and community. And that's what the last call show is all about. We're giving you an open look at what we're looking at when we look at the previews list when we look at the foc list and uh yeah come sit have an adult kool-aid with us and enjoy that show um but we've also got a show uh coming right after this episode don't we Ryan? exactly so immediately after this show published on the channel will be the latest video for that back issue bolo series and this week we're going over five back issues for spider-verse isn't that correct Absolutely. And again, we could talk about 25, 30 Spider-Verse keys that tie into that upcoming 2022 Spider-Verse movie. And we, we will. We will. We will. There's gonna, that's going to be a multi-parter. But we started with five books that you should be on the lookout for. Great opportunity if you're hitting your LCS or a convention this weekend to go ahead and start digging through those back issue bins and check out. And if you're you know, hot to trot on some Green Lantern action after reading Far Sector – on the channel, we've got a back issue bolo episode with some green lantern keys. So be sure to check out the new video premiering uh, to, immediately after this episode. Um, and be sure to check out the one that came out last week. Um, and we listened to you guys. And you guys wanted that back issue bolo, and we are bringing it to you. Right. And also going forward, if you aren't already, make sure you subscribe. Hit that bell notification so that way you always get notified when videos like that are published on the channel. I'm Brian Wood with Jack DeMeo. This has been The Bolo Show.